Hi, welcome to the next in our series on Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Um, today we're going to cover more relationships between the magnetic field. We're going to cover something called vector potential. Uh, this is actually quite a confusing concept the first time you encounter it, and it's confusing because it is confusing. There's been a lot of debate over whether this really exists, how, it, how it's used, and whether it's simply something physical or just a tool for calculation. And we're going to avoid all of those debates by simply introducing it and not trying to really explain where it comes from because quite honestly I'm not sure where it comes from. If you're in my class you can follow along in the textbook in section 5.4. Now where we left off last time is we were developing what I'm calling a magnetics triangle which is similar to our electrostatics triangle and we saw that we could uh, relate the current element, which is what actually generates magnetic fields, um, to the field and flux, which are H and B respectively, and remember that the relationship between field and flux is that uh, flux B is equal to mu, the permeability, times H, and we'll cover what the permeability is a little bit later. Um, and we can go with the Biot-Savart law to convert from current and do this nasty integral to get field, and we also saw we can either use M ampere circuital law or the curl to go from the field back into the current or the current density, J. We also learned there's no such thing as a magnetic charge, and so the divergence of the magnetic flux is always equal to zero, no matter what you do. There's never a point that only emits or sucks up magnetic field lines. Obviously the piece we're missing is what used to be the electric potential. And so what I'm going to introduce is what we use to calculate this, to complete this triangle, which is called the magnetic vector potential, or just the vector potential for sure. And so without deriving all of it, which is really more of a mathematical operation than an intuitive or physical operation, here we go. We have various relationships. We define a magnetic vector potential or vector potential, but unlike our electric potential, which was a scalar quantity and created a scalar field, this now creates another vector field, which creates all kinds of complications mathematically in dealing with things. And it's worthwhile to note that both the vector potential the fields and fluxes and the generating elements in magnetic fields are all vectors. We have no scalar fields here. You'll also notice we can go from current elements to vector potentials either with integral relationships or differential relationships, derivative type relationships. We can go from the vector potential back to the field or flux through a derivative type relationship we just learned in the last lecture, which is the curl. But we also find that there's no simple formula, at least none that I know of, to go from the field or flux to the vector potential. There are ways of doing this, but there's nothing you can sort of plug into. It all involves making some choices. So we're simply not going to talk about that one. That's sort of beyond the scope of where I want these video lectures to be. So unfortunately, I can't give you a good explanation of the vector potential, but let's try to define it at least a little bit uh, before we look at these relationships I've just defined in the magnetics triangle. So what do we know about the vector potential? It turns out that there is such a thing as a vector potential. You can actually do experiments and really measure this physical quantity. So it's not just sort of a mathematical tool. It's something that actually exists, but it's something you don't see a lot in engineering. It's not like a voltage that you're going to pull out of a DMM or an oscilloscope and measure. It's not something we, we measure or use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's no simple intuitive explanation uh, that you'll use in electrical engineering like there is for electric potential. And so for this reason we treat it more as a mathematical operation and so a lot of books and most books will actually describe the vector potential as an aid in calculating magnetic fields. And this is generally what it's used for. We're going to use it when we calculate antennas or how we can couple radiation out of a circuit into space and it's going to be useful there. But unless you get into quantum mechanics the idea of vector potential is really just as an aid to calculation. So analogously to the same way we did it for the electric field, um, sometimes if you actually want to calculate an electric field, it turns out to be easier to first calculate the potential and then use the relationship to convert potential to field and then go and calculate the field from there rather than calculating the field directly using this equation. Um, because you'll notice there's not a cross product here. So it is a little bit simpler, but we still have vector quantities in the numerators of both components. Um, it turns out that 
this is easier for problems when you're calculating the field over a region, but it's usually not easier if you're doing some kind of symmetric problem like you'd find a homework problem in your book that's chosen to be relatively simple where you're trying to calculate the magnetic field along a line at a symmetry point or at some individual point. And the reason for this is because we have to do a derivative. You can't do a derivative without knowing the the vector potential over a region of space. Uh, derivatives aren't defined at points, remember. So you actually have to calculate this rather than at a particular point over a region, which can make these these problems more complicated. So don't automatically think when you're given a calculate the magnetic field problem that you want to first do the vector potential, then take the curl, and then calculate the magnetic field from that. Most homework problems don't work this way. Let's next talk about the conversion from either a vector potential to a current or from the current back to the vector potential, which is given by this equation that looks very similar to Poisson's equation and this integral expression right here, which we just covered. Uh, we call this expression del squared A, which is the vector potential, is equal to uh, the permeability times the current density J is Poisson's vector equation. And this is not going to be solved the same way at all, because remember, before, this was a scalar equation. When we were working with electric fields. We had the, the um, electric potential V there, and either the charge, which was a scalar, or zero if we had Laplace's equation. And we can't do that, because both of these quantities are vectors in this case. In order to solve this, if you were asked to do it, remember we can break any vector into three components. So the way you think about Poisson's vector equation is basically three scalar equations. One which is solved in x, one which is solved in y, and one which is solved in z. And if the current is only along one axis, like having a straight wire, the vector potential is going to be along the same axis, and you only need to solve one of these things. And you can use the same types of numerical techniques here um, to calculate the vector potential when currents are known. Finally, to convert from vector potential back into the magnetic flux, we use this expression right here. So this essentially allows, once you've calculated the vector potential, perhaps using Poisson's vector equation, to go down and calculate a field from it. This expression is also very, very useful when you're given problems where you want to calculate the magnetic flux through a surface. When we come and start to understand Faraday's law and inductance, this is going to be really, really important to be able to calculate magnetic fluxes through surfaces. And so you can see that the magnetic flux through surface is just given by this surface integral here. If you go ahead and replace B with del cross A, which this equation allows you to do and substitute it in here, you essentially see now we can use Stokes' law to basically represent the flux through a surface as the line integral of the vector potential around the circumference of any surface. And so these are some useful things you can do to simplify problems when you're asked to calculate the magnetic flux through a surface, which as I said, we're going to see the importance of in just a few lectures. And so that's basically it. This is as complete a magnetic triangle as we're going to get, 